Um, so uh, I think hopefully, Sam, that sets you up quite nicely for uh, the kind of big picture about why this project, why the Ignition project is so incredibly important and has been so successful. And Sam, I'll hand over to you for the next part of the programme. Yes, <laughs> important. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks so much for, um, for being with us today and for such a great... A great introduction to some of the challenges that we're, um, that we're facing. So I'm going to talk a little bit more, as Sarah says, about the local context, um, the role of nature-based solutions to tackling some of those challenges that Sarah's talked about, and how Ignition has, has helped put in the foundations to help us do that in Greater Manchester. As Sarah says, we're, we're facing a climate and biodiversity uh, emergency, and in Greater Manchester that means for us uh, achieving our, our aim of being uh, a net zero city region by 2038. But as Sarah says, even if we meet that target, the climate's already changing uh, and we're already seeing its effects um, in more extreme weather events. Uh, in our towns and cities, that means uh, increased rainfall, increased flooding, increased heat waves, um, and they're already challenging the limits of our, of our built environment in our, in our towns and cities. In Greater Manchester, we'll have, um, by 2050, 30% more rainfall in the winter and summer temperature summer temperatures are five to six degrees warmer than they are today. And I think just yesterday, the Met Office uh, increased by one degree the temperature that must be reached for a heat wave to be triggered across most of eastern England. Um, so this is already happening, it's already here. And as, as Sarah said, the effects of that will be felt disproportionately by our, our most disadvantaged communities here in Greater Manchester. And at the same time, nature will also be on the, in, in the at the forefront of, uh, of feeling the force of those impacts, the damage to our biodiversity and the ecosystems they, they support. Um, and those impacts will only get worse um, as the effects of climate change become increasingly apparent and if we don't tackle that adaptation gap, and that's the gap between uh, the, the climate risks we face and that are increasing and the action that we're actually taking uh, to combat those risks. But as Sarah says, there's reason for optimism. Nature can help us uh, bridge that adaptation gap and integrating nature into how our towns and cities work, how they run, how they function, um, can help us adapt to the impacts of climate change. And this is our, our green infrastructure. And, and for us in urban areas, this means using natural solutions, green roofs, green walls, sustainable drainage systems, um, street trees, green spaces, to help, um, to help our urban areas and those that are most uh, at risk adapt to climate change. And, and at the same time as bridging that adaptation gap, we know that those solutions and, and what you can see on the screen here um, provide space for biodiversity. They can help lock up carbon. And they provide so many of those other wider benefits that, that those of us in this room know, know about for health, for well-being, for amenity, and for things like air quality as well. So they just tick all of the, the boxes that traditional solutions, pipes, uh, tanks, barriers, barrages, they can't compete with, with the multiple benefits that nature-based solutions uh, provide us with. And over the past few years, we've developed, the tools have been developed to help us understand uh, those benefits. Uh, in Greater Manchester, we've used those to, to take a natural capital approach. So understanding and valuing uh, our natural assets and the, the value that they, they provide us with. And our natural, account, natural capital accounts in Greater Manchester show that we get over a billion pounds of benefits each and every year from our natural environment, from our green spaces, from our uh, trees, from, from all of that green and blue infrastructure. Um, but despite those benefits, their, their potential is undervalued. And we have some fantastic demonstrator projects in Greater Manchester. We've got West Gorton Sponge Park. We've got uh, new wetlands in, in Kersal. Uh, we've got examples in Dalesbrow and Howen Street, just, just down the road in Salford, um, of nature-based solutions being used. But they're not being deployed at the scale that we need them to be to bridge that adaptation gap. And everyone here today has a role to play in, in turning that round. And that's what today is all about, talking about how we can use the learning of Ignition to help us, to help us bridge that adaptation gap. Sarah spoke about, um, about finance, and, and it's much cheaper to invest early to combat the risk of flooding and overheating than live with the costs of inaction and deal with it later on. But as well as that adaptation gap, there's also that gap between um, in, in finance and funding. So for, for natural flood management alone, that's one part of adaptation. That's estimated by the Green Finance Institute to be 
350 million pounds in the UK. So that's the gap between what, what needs to be funded to, um, to adapt us in just that one part of adaptation. And that's part of a broader um, gap of 56 billion pounds to meet the wider nature-related outcomes that we need to see in the UK and that the Environment Act and the government's 25-year environment plan wants, wants to see in the UK. And that gap can't be met by public funding uh, alone. And we need to leverage in private finance to bridge that gap. Um, if we think about uh, our drive to net zero in the UK, um, private investment has been brought in successfully in, in things like offshore wind. So it can, it can and has been done in the UK. But investment in nature and, and adaptation is lagging behind. And in 2018, only 1.5% of all international climate finance supported nature-based solutions for adaptation. And we know there's, there's, we're told there's private capital available, there's a willingness from investors to invest in green. We certainly know we need more projects like that happening on the ground to bridge that adaptation gap, but um, that gap is not being bridged at the moment. And let alone are we addressing the issues that Sarah talked about in, in developing parts of the world. So it, it was against that, that backdrop, backdrop, those challenges, those opportunities, that, that Ignition started uh, three years ago now. Uh, it was about the need to bridge that adaptation gap uh, in a nature-positive way with private investment um, that the Ignition project started in 2019. And our aim was to put in place the, the mechanisms to accelerate investment in natural solutions to bridge that adaptation gap. So we set out to develop uh, the evidence, the tools, the resources to support doing that and inform the business case for, for pipelines of prospective natural solutions projects um, that could be invested in. So how do, we, how do we mainstream and replicate some of the great examples we've got here in Greater Manchester? And doing that, we set out to look at different parts of the, the urban landscape that you've probably seen on your, on your walk here this morning. Uh, so we've got land around buildings in urban areas, we've got roofs, we've got parks, we've got our streets and highways. Um, and we also set out to focus on um, the challenge of retrofitting those in our urban environment. So obviously through planning and, and new development, we can, we can influence and require certain things of that. But what about the large proportion of our, of our towns and cities that aren't going to be redeveloped? How do we, how do we um, introduce natural solutions to those areas? And reflecting the need for partners across a range of sectors to come together, the project brought together 12 partners from universities, uh, businesses, and business representative organisations, environmental NGOs, regulators, and uh, local government to, to tackle that challenge. So that's where we started out on this journey uh, three years ago. Um, so what of our experience? Well, I think our experience has been that, that bridging that adaptation gap, there are, there are some big opportunities uh, and huge benefits to be had from greening our, our city region. But there are a number of challenges and steps to overcome to make places like this a, a, a reality and to mainstream them and to be able to attract, attract uh, funding and investment into them. I think, and those are, are common to most projects in the, in the natural environment now that rely mostly on, on public funding um, to, to get off the ground. But through the hard work of, of the project, we've put in place the building blocks to, to overcome these challenges. And today, hopefully, is all about us sharing that with you um, and to help us work together in the future to, to bridge that adaptation gap and work together uh, to do that. So um, before we hear in a bit more detail shortly, I just wanted to give you a bit of a, a flavour of some of the things that we've, we've, um, we've done in the project that you'll hear more about and a bit about that journey from um, conceiving of, of a... Of a a green space and natural solutions to actually get into the point of, of, um, of seeing them and seeing them being invested in on the ground. And the first step along that journey really is, is proving the benefits of nature-based solutions and demonstrating the benefits that these sorts of, these sorts of projects have. And through, um, through Ignition, we've um, developed, for example, a comprehensive uh, evidence base of MBS benefits and, and partners here are already using that to build the business case um, for their natural solutions projects, and we're going to hear about some of those later on. Uh, adding to the examples that I mentioned earlier, there's also the Living Lab at, at the University of Salford, which Norham will talk about later. And that, that, as hopefully many of you will have seen yesterday, is a living demonstration that the benefits of natural solutions um, can have on a particular site. And research there is already gathering the data on, on those benefits, those multiple benefits. And I hope many, many of you managed to get there yesterday and join the I think 600 people have already been there and 1,000 people who've taken the virtual tour on site. So we've really managed to reach a huge, a huge amount of people and engage people 
in the, the benefits of natural solutions through the, through the Living Lab at the University of Salford. Um, and we've be, whilst we've got the tools, though, to, to value nature at, at a strategic level, for example, through those natural capital accounts, doing so at the scale of a particular site or building is, um, is context-specific, and that, that can bring with it um, challenges if we compare it to a solar panel where we can understand quite readily and model the amount, of, the amount of energy that's going to generate over the year. It's less tangible and, and more hard work to understand the benefits of a, a new park, a new green space, a new green wall. Um, and um, we have some of the tools through the Environment Act to start to measure some of this in terms of biodiversity net gain and, and the biodiversity metric, but we need more, um, we need more standardised way of understanding the benefits of nature-based solutions. Um, and, and measuring those in particular contexts. And that's a challenge that's come out of the project for us to work with universities, experts, and policymakers to understand, to actually be able to really be clear on the benefits in particular contexts. Uh, secondly, if we can prove those benefits, then we need to be able to capture, identify and capture their, their value, their, their monetary value, if we're to convert that into, into investment. Um, we need to put monetary values on those benefits and be able to... to capture them and have somebody pay, you know, capture them to pay for the costs of doing this if we want these to become mainstream. So what are the, what are the benefits worth to whom? Are they willing to um, and able to pay for them over the longer term that, that we see these sort of benefits over 10, 15, 20 years? Are there, are there organisations willing and able to pay for those benefits? And we've, through the project, engaged a range of different stakeholders with the potential for willingness to pay for those, for those benefits. We've talked to property owners uh, to local businesses, to our water company, to local authorities and to, to the public at large about the, the benefits that nature-based solutions can have. And we'll be hearing about the business cases we've developed to make the case for investment in a range of, of um, natural solutions projects that we hope will be delivered after the project and leave a, a legacy and a blueprint for how this can be done in Greater Manchester and beyond in the future. Uh, we've learned that the strength, obviously the strength of natural solutions like this is in their, is in their multiple benefits. Um, but they're not all monetizable. Some of them are, are health benefits and public goods, uh, and it's not always easy to find organizations willing and able to pay for them. But that means we need to bring lots of different organizations together to co-invest in these sorts, of, these sorts of spaces and be smarter about how we use public funding alongside um, contributions from others. And partnerships are, are really important in doing that. Um, and the challenge for us in Greater Manchester and the Combined Authority is continuing to, to work with you and support all the efforts going on in, in Greater Manchester to focus on delivering um, more projects uh, like this. So thirdly, there's, there's then the step of, of if we can identify those benefits, if we've got people wanting to see these projects happen, is developing that case for investment and getting ready to deliver those, those projects. And we'll hear a bit more about this in, in the rest of this morning's, um, this morning's talks. Um, to do that, if you've got multiple different organisations coming together, you need the right sort of structures in place to be able to do that, particularly if, um, if private investment is to be secured. And Ignition has supported, up, supported the, um, the setting up of the Greater Manchester Environment Fund in, in Greater Manchester, and that's a new charity with the aim of providing a way of bringing together different funding from private and public sources to be able to deliver projects on the ground and to be able to deliver these sorts of projects um, in the future and have the right structures and governance um, in place to be able to do that. And hopefully through, through setting that up, we've got a blueprint for bringing together multiple partners in the future uh, to co-fund projects where, where one partner cannot do that on their own. And then if we can do that, there's then how do we mainstream this and, and see more, more investment in, um, in nature-based solutions in the future? And I think through the project, and hopefully what you'll hear about today, I think we've put in place the foundations to um, to do that in the future, demonstrating the business case, developing the right partnerships, designing the structures and the governance to be able to do that, and the, and the decision support tools, what can we use in terms of our evidence to, to build that case. And over the next 12 months, we want to start delivery of the, the pipeline of projects we've identified through Ignition and that we've developed, um, and use, um, use public funding smartly alongside um, private finance to be able to do that. And we hope over time that will help us Build, um, build confidence in the insulation and the maintenance and the, the market and for, for natural solutions. And we've seen, hopefully you've all had a chance to look around some of the, the, um, the stalls here today to see how um, local businesses are already, are already doing that in Greater Manchester. 
So what does this experience um, tell us? I think that it's, it's challenging to get, to get um, natural solutions projects off the ground to attract private investment, but there is ambition out there across sectors to make this work, and we know that today from, from the people that we've got in this room and, and online. We understand the benefits of nature, and we have tools to understand the value of that, and particularly the value that that provides us over traditional um, grey infrastructure solutions. But we need to reflect that value. Um, we need to reflect that in the value that we, as businesses, as the public sector, as communities, as citizens, individuals, place on nature and adaptation now and the decisions we take. We need to value them uh, and the benefits that they provide if we're going to see them upscaled uh, like this. But, and there is an appetite um, to, to change that. And if we don't value the, um, the benefits of nature sufficiently in all of our decisions, this makes the business case for investing in them challenging to, to stack up. And that can be exacerbated by uncertainties around, around their cost because they're not, they're not standard and they're context specific. But as we've seen today, we've got a, a growing sector of suppliers wanting to innovate and work, work with all of us on making that happen. And we've got people working on um, upskilling and educating people uh, on that as well. We need benefits to be not just calculated, but also for organizations being incentivized and wanting to pay for those benefits. Um, do they re relate to a cost saving or an income for an organization? Our businesses, um, our water company, etc., are they incentivized or regulated in a way that, that, that makes them want to invest in these sorts of solutions? And that is being increasingly recognized by government and, um, and our regulators as a barrier. Given the multiple benefits of, of natural solutions as well, that this needs to happen across multiple different organizations. So we need to come together in, in partnerships, as we have done today, to agree on what we want to see, where, to align interests and budgets, to co-invest in, in uh, nature-based solutions. And for us, I think city regions, uh, like the work we've done in Greater Manchester on, on Ignition, we have a really important role to play in bringing organizations together in deciding what our priorities are building those partnerships, putting in place the right structures to bring people together to invest. And Ignition has really helped us deepen and strengthen the partnerships that we already, we already had in place, but to take them to the, to the next level. And also government policy needs to help us and, and support that agenda as well. We've seen some of that in the Environment Act, and it's going to be really important as to how that develops and, and plays out in terms of the detail of all of that. So in short, we all of us here today um, have a role to play in realising uh, the role of natural solutions in bridging that adaptation gap that we face, be that as businesses, suppliers, the public sector, individuals, communities, we all, we all have a role to play in that. And through Ignition, we've put in place the foundations to help us do that in, in Greater Manchester 